You're listening to the Stable Management Podcast, where we discuss the barn management topics that you're passionate about. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Stable Management Podcast. Our goal is to bring you a real world look into the parts of horse farm management that you love or hate most, such as stall bedding, farm equipment, and pasture maintenance. During each bi-monthly episode, we'll be joined by an expert guest who shares their experiences with and perspectives on an important stable management topic. I'm your host, Haley Kerstetter, and my guest today is Dr. Jorge Colon from Cornell University. We're going to be talking about horse farm finances today. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Colon. Thank you for having me, Haley. My pleasure. We're going to jump right into this topic since there's a lot to talk about. And my first question for you is, what are some of the main reasons why barn managers need to keep an organized record of their bills and invoices and work off of a budget? That's a very important question, and and it can be very simple to answer, very complicated to answer. Um, The reason why they need to work off an organized budget is so that they know whether they have the money and the finances available to pay for those things that they need to pay for. That's that's the basic element of a budget, right? It's a financial plan associated with the forecasting of expenses, income and expenses, inflow of cash and outflow of cash associated with the running of a business or any type of operation. And so the more detailed and managed that budget is, the better planning and less financial uncertainty that barn manager will have associated with running that barn. Um some of the things related to the budget are related to expenses that are occurring in a monthly scenario that while the price might change over time, you can still account for that expense happening and you can ballpark guesstimate what that price would be. You know, if you're off by 10 bucks in a $300 item, then you're okay because you can probably manage if you budget it for 300 bucks and something was 310 or 290 and you got 10 extra, then you're good to go. But if you're not accounting for that expense that is going to be recurring, then you're going to be in a bad situation. You're going to have some expenses that are unexpected expenses, and those you have to somehow, some way account for them by imagining the potential worst case scenario happening. Like, you know, you have a brand new fence put in and, and gates and whatever, and horses do run through them, and you have expenses associated with maintenance that you did not expect to have. So there's got to be a budget associated with unexpected expenses as well. And with that also comes the source of the income. Like, where are you having the inflow of cash? Is this clients that are paying you for something? Is this related to you provide services for somebody else? So then they're paying you for a salary or whatever the reason or the source of the money coming in. Then not only is the amount of money coming in, but when is it coming in? Because there is a component associated when is it that bills need to be paid in relationship to when that cash is coming in so we can go into extreme details about budget but basically to be able to financially in a sound fashion run a barn man uh, a barn uh, facility for example you need to know where the inflow and outflow as cash is coming from and going to So let's jump into some of the details um, about a budget now. Can you talk a bit about the main components of a useful budget and how they should be organized? Yeah. Um, So I think I touched on that. So let me just expand on it. Let's go on the expense. Well, let's go on the income side of the equation, which is the simplest one in theory, right? There's going to be a source of income associated with your operation. Let's assume that you're, for example, a barn manager of a boarding stable and your source of income is associated with people who pay you to board their animals. So your budget needs to include the amount of each transaction that is going to be happening with money coming into the business and the date that you expect that money coming in. Now, this brings into the equation the additional component of when are you invoicing your clients? How is it that your clients are paying you? How are you facilitating the payment process so you can receive money at the time that you want to receive it? Are you sending bills on the last day of the month and you're expecting them to be paid off within two weeks? So now you're two weeks into the new month and you still haven't paid paid for the previous month. Do you have an electronic fund transfer system set up so that when you send the bill out on the 31 or you automatically collect either, either through credit card or through a cash transaction on the 31st or on the last day of that month? So when is that money coming in? How much is coming in? And you're forecasting as to what's going to be happening in the future. 
That's important because you need to know how much money is available to pay those bills on the day that those bills are due. So when you go on the expense side, you're going to have the expense associated with your running your boarding stable, for example. You know, you're going to if you're going to be paying for the feed, um, you're going to be paying the hay, you're going to be paying for the concentrate. Uh, you probably have barn help associated with you probably have electric and utility bills. Um, you probably have insurance in your facility. You're going to look at every single component that will form an expense associated with running that business, including the paying yourself component of it and the benefits associated with you working for yourself, whether it's for mandated expenses like your portion of Social Security and Medicare taxes to the fact that you need to make enough money to make a living and be able to take a vacation and be able to retire in the future. All these things are things that you have expenses for that you need to have income for. So you can look at backtracking of what has happened in the past to see what you are expecting to happen in the future. And those things that are repeating are easier to manage because, and you can budget for them because you expect them to happen. And as I mentioned at the beginning, there will be those things that are unexpected expenses that you also need to budget for and manage so you can be organized in that fashion. So the main components are understanding what the sources of income based on the amount and when they're going to be happening and then the sources of expenses and when is it that you're paying them and the amount for these things for the ones that you know are going to happen and for the ones that potentially in worst case scenarios could happen and if you if you over budget for expenses that don't happen because nothing went wrong then that just gives you more breathing room for the future for when things do go wrong or ability to expand the operation either by hiring more employees if you're growing or for leaner times or to absorb better increases in prices with expenses in, uh, related to inflation or anything like that. So the components of budgets is just really understanding the sources of the inflow and the outflow, some system that you utilize to keep track of it, whether it's by the good old pen and paper and keeping a ledger, or you can work off Excel as a, or any other um, uh, software tool, or you can get into anything associated with, as an example, Quicken or QuickBooks or anything like that, or any other company, I'm not promoting any, but specifically, but any company like that, that has an advanced software system to manage these things for you. I think one of the things that might keep people from starting a budget is it just seems very daunting or like you mentioned, horses will be horses. Mm -hmm. They'll try to hurt themselves constantly. They'll rip down your new fencing. Um, and it can be kind of frustrating when you make a budget and then you continually get it wrong. So what are some of the, what's some advice that you have for people who might not have a lot of experience with developing and working off a budget or they've started and they've gotten really frustrated with it because they're not doing well? Well, daunting is an understatement, no question about it. But I personally think that how daunting the budget process is, is insignificant in comparison to the issues of not doing one because flying by the seat of your pants might work and the day that it doesn't work is could be disaster it could be the end of your business bankruptcy or anything like that so where to start is a personal mental state of frame of mind of understanding that you know, most people just don't like math and numbers and accounting and stuff like that. Understandable. Um, but just understand that you got to do it. You got to do it. And it's not really that difficult. It's tedious and it's time consuming and it requires attention to detail. No question about it. But it's not difficult to do. And you can be very, very simplistic in the process of keeping a budget or you can be extremely detail oriented and have, you know, to the scent of every single thing that might happen. Anything in between that is acceptable and all of it is better than nothing. So where I would start if I was either, you know, scared of the process or not used to the process or just not even know where to start is just literally take pen and paper and just write down what are the expenses that happened over the last 30, 60, 90 days. Mark which of those are going to be repeating expenses. You know you're going to have to buy hay, for example. How often are you buying hay? 
ballpark what amount of hay are you buying how can you keep track of what the potential current price of hay is because if prices are rising when you budget for the next purchase of hay you can't really base it a hundred percent on the old price of hay because it's going to be costing you more in the future so how much do I increase it by? I don't know, maybe it's been rising by 5% or 2% or whatever that might be. So if you know what the price of hay has been and how often you buy hay based on your consumption rate and how much you can store at the farm, et cetera, et cetera, then you can account for or forecast, hey, in anywhere between 60 and 90 days, I'm going to have this amount of money going out for hay. And that's just as easy as it sounds. What is the water bill on normal usage scenarios, as long as I don't have a water break somewhere underground or above ground or whatever? What is the normal bill for water, for electricity, for whatever that might be? And then you know that that process repeats itself. The difficult ones, no question about it, are the emergency funds associated with the horse running through the fence, right? As a veterinarian, we're guaranteed to have job security because horses in a loving way i'll say that are a little bit of self-destructive right if nothing's going wrong it's just because not enough time has passed something will go wrong they they're mischievous and they try to do stuff that we can't figure out why they do it but that's why we uh, love them so much and that's why we have job security and entertainment factor but so just plan for it if you had to replace boarding fence then or you have a friend or a colleague or somebody who has had to replace boarding fence. Hey, if I had to replace X, Y, or Z, ballpark, how much is that going to cost? And understand that at some point in time, it will might take you a while. Maybe say, hey, within the next six months, hopefully nothing happens today. Nothing happens tomorrow. Within the next six months, I'm going to have put away into the budget $2,000 or whatever the number might be to replace fencing if and when a horse runs through it. You don't have to have all the money in one month. Now, the problem is that if the horse runs through the fence that month, then you had a look. But over time, you save for something, and then you save that within your budget. And then you have that money on standby, sitting in the bench, waiting to the deploy the day that you actually need it. So even though it's daunting, um, really the daunting part is just getting your feet moving and getting started. And it's not difficult to get started. Literally just look at your previous expenses. And as you go through that, then you be able to forecast what should happen in the future and then start guesstimating about those emergency scenarios. The income side is a little bit easier because usually there's one source of income based on that type of business, right? It's going to be the boarding. If you're a boarding stable, it's going to be the the fees that your clients pay you to board their animals. So the sources of income is usually one type of source clients versus the source of expenses that are very varied and depends on the facility. But really the most difficult part is really just stopping being afraid and just literally just sitting down and looking at the expenses. It could be your um, bank account statements. It could be your credit card statements associated with the farm, whatever, whatever you're paying your bills with those bills for that for the last 60 to 90 days, is what I would look at and then just start accounting for those for going forward. Yeah, you mentioned um, a really good point about being prepared for emergencies, but what do you do if they happen, you know, before you're exactly prepared for them? Um, You know, and something that I struggled with just creating a budget for my personal horses was that exact scenario where I would either just get the regular budget wrong or they would do something while I was trying to build up a bit of an emergency fund for them and I would feel like I was being set back before I even got started so maybe it'll be encouraging to someone to hear that uh, they're not the only ones struggling with it but you know once you get into it and you're a few months in you get into the routine it's much easier and you start to build up that a little bit of emergency fund in case they do something, which they inevitably will. Yeah, they will. And coming up with the money the day that something happens, that's the worst case scenario for you. Now, you cannot, you meaning anybody, cannot prevent the fact that, okay, I'm going to start saving today for a potential emergency in the future, and the emergency happens tomorrow, right? Unless you had unlimited funds, you would not have been saving the amount that you needed for that potential future. So, Life is full of risks, and this is one of those risks. You're mitigating and reducing that risk by 
putting your foot forward and starting to save for that risk. But if that risk happens before you have accumulated the funds for it, then yes, you're in the different scenario. There's other sources of funding, personal loans. Um, there's, you know, this will be a different episode, different podcast, but where are those other sources if the emergency were to happen before you have all the money for the emergency? But you will always not have money for the emergency if you don't get started. So right. at some point in time, you have to start. And as soon as you start, the, the hardest dollar to save is that first one. Once you save that first dollar, it's not that more difficult to save that second one. And by the time you save the fifth, saving two by two is easier than your initial one by one. And so the hardest dollar is the first one. So just start, put your foot down and say, I need to put money away for when something goes wrong. Because if you're in the horse business, something will. That's just a fact of life. This is why we love horses. Yeah, that's such a good way of putting it. One of the other common struggles that I hear from barn managers is that they struggle to hold their clients accountable for payment, um, whether it's just board or it's an extra service like clipping the horse or going to a horse show. So do you have any advice for barn managers who are struggling with keeping their clients accountable when it comes to payment for services? So I ran into this as a veterinarian as well, right? This is the problem that we all have in the service industry and, and the barn manager will be a service provider, no different than I was when I was a practicing veterinarian. And so my word of advice based on personal experience is you have to be very clear, very detailed, and very black and white up front with every single client that you have. This is the way we operate. This is the way we run business. And this is what is expected from you in exchange for what you're expecting from us. And it gets very detailed and very organized facilitate the process for someone paying you. We are in the 2024 year where immediate electronic transactions through your phone are a fact of life that just happens daily. When I started practice, cell phones didn't exceed it, exist. And when it came that time that you could hook up that little device that you could attach to the bottom of your phone and you can actually swipe a credit card through it, it was a miracle that you could actually do that in the field. But we are so much more advanced today. So you need to facilitate the, if your problem is collecting money from your clients, I want to know, or you want to know, what are you doing to facilitate the process as much as you can for that client to be able to pay you? Because at the end of the day, it's their responsibility. But if they don't come through with the responsibility, the one who suffers is you because you need to pay your bills forward. Although that hay person's not going to deliver hay, that feed person's not going to deliver feed, the electricity company is going to cut off your electricity. So how are you facilitating the process and what can you do for it? That's number one. Number two, as I said, you need to be very strict and forward. The invoice will go out on this day and is payable this day. And there's no option B for paying your invoice. It is not your responsibility as the stable owner or manager or both to subsidize the care of the horse for that person who decides that they want to have a horse, but they can't afford it. We all understand our sentimentals about the issue because we have all lived it. But when you're running your business, you're not in the business of subsidizing somebody else's scenario. And so what are the ramifications and penalties associated with not paying bills on time? Some of them are going to be warnings and some of them are going to be you need to take your horse off the property or you have to put a lien on the animal. Or so, I mean, you can we can get into many different avenues associated with how do you address this issue? But I think that the majority of the clients, I don't know what percentage, but I would say it's going to be in the high 90s. If you have a good system of information in place, if the rules have been set forward strictly and fairly, and you have done everything you can to facilitate the process of getting paid, then the amount of clients that will still not follow through will be a very small amount. It will never be perfect but you can actually manage this much better to a point where it doesn't affect your budget. Yeah, I like what you mentioned about facilitating the payment process and making it simple for your clients to understand. Um, 
a couple of months ago, I, I went away and I was away on the first of the month when my board was due. And I realized that after I had left. And so I, you know, immediately texted the brand manager and I said, Hey, I, I messed this one up. Do you have another way for me to pay you? And she said, Oh yeah, you know, I do Venmo too. So I Venmoed her and she made it very easy for me, but that also ensured that she got her payment on time. It was easy enough for me to do while I was away. And now I know in the future, if I forget again, or I don't go to the bar in the days, the day that board is due to hand in a physical check, you know, I have a backup option, which makes it really easy for me as the horse owner to get her paid on time. Yeah, because as as you mentioned, so you mentioned Venmo as an example, and I'm, again, I'm an older person and I work with Venmo, but not the way that the younger generation works. But one thing that I understand, I think as time has changed, for example, there's a difference in me saying, hey, Haley, uh, you owe me board for the month. Can you please send me a check? If I do that, I'm asking for the money that I'm owed, but now I got to wait for you to respond to the message. Then you get your checkbook. And how often do you, do you have a stamp? Do you have, I actually had to send a bill the other day. I didn't have an envelope in my house. It took me days before I could find an envelope. So I could send a check that I had on hand to pay somebody who had done something for me at my house. So there's many reasons why that payment is going to get delayed. So then I could say, okay, Haley, um, well, you can pay me for Venmo. Here is my Venmo information. Well, that means that you now have to go through the process of, okay, you have to get in your Venmo and then you have to make sure that you find me on your Venmo, make sure you pay me and not some other person that's named just like me. Da, da, da. Or through Venmo, I can send a request payment and, and you literally get a URL link that you click it and everything is, so everything was done for you so that you can pay me. And so you, the the person needing the money, the person needing to get paid, can do many, many, many things to facilitate this process to ensure that you get paid. And by the way, for those listeners who might say anything about related to the transaction fees associated with the credit cards or if Venmo keeps some money or PayPal or whatever it might be, I'm telling you that at the end of the day, the cost of that transaction fee for someone to do the transaction for you is insignificant in relationship to the fact of getting paid. Yes, you rather have 100% of the bill paid, but if you get 97% of it, it's better than not getting it paid. Yeah, that's such a good point. Do you enjoy the Stable Management Podcast? Want to learn even more about horse health care? Get your management and industry questions answered at Ask the Horse Live, a free audio event available exclusively from thehorse.com. Each Ask the Horse Live episode focuses on a specific equine healthcare topic chosen by our editors. We gather leading veterinarians, researchers, and industry experts to tackle your toughest questions. You can also hear on-demand episodes of Ask the Horse on thehorse.com or wherever you get your podcasts. So for those who have not yet started their business, whether it be boarding, training, whatever, um, what do they need to consider financially before they get started and to reduce their risk of serious loss as they begin the business venture? So multiple things, and I think we touched on some of them. First of all, expect the unexpected, because if you're not expecting things to go unexpectedly, then you're going to run into trouble. Things will go wrong. Um Weather will destroy your barn. Horses will destroy your barn. Clients will destroy your barn. I mean, anything and everything that can happen can happen, right? So the first thing I would do or say that you should do is make friends, make networking connections with people who are in the business that you want to be in. If you currently board somewhere, then spend some time with that person. Invite them to lunch. Invite them for coffee just at your own dime and just... Can I sit down with you to talk about the business side of running the barn? How often do you have to order hay? How do you figure out how much to hay to order? How do you deal with the water bill? What are, you know? Do you have different suppliers for it? Imagine, I don't know, for example, that you have a propane in your facility. Like, how do you choose what propane provider to give you to get gas from? And, you know, is there an issue like, why did you get this side this versus that side what? You know, hey, I see that you have this type of tractor. Like, are you happy with it? Not in terms of, are you happy with it in terms of, do you wish you had gone on a bigger one or is the size that you got good enough for it? You know, just start going through all the options of the things that would be required for you to run that business. You know, how difficult is it to be getting barn help lately? Is it like, 
abundant up, uh, uh, availability of help to hire or like, am I going to be doing the work 90% of the time because there's no help available? These are important questions to ask. And, you know, how much are you paying your help, et cetera, et cetera. What are you doing that's working? What are you doing that is not working? What are you doing that you wish you could do differently? These are very educated questions to ask someone who is already in the business of what of that which you want to follow. And then if you have a better knowledge of the expectations to be had, then you can start planning accordingly, you know, based on this, what what type of income do I need to have to be able to support the operation that I want to have? Am I going to need to have 10 clients plus? Am I going to need to be boarding 20 clients plus? Well, I need to be boarding 20 clients plus, but I only have space for 15. So what would I need? So you need to envision what the business would be at day one of opening, after week one of opening, after 60 days of opening, and a year after opening, and envision what that place could be like and what could go well and not go well. And then you will reduce, you're not going to stop it, but you will reduce the, um, you will attenuate the degree of uh, surprises, of surprise that the surprises will provide you with. But just get educated, get educated, talk, network, talk to people who are doing that, which you want to do. Just don't start from, I want to open a new barn and just go for it. You need to talk to other people. If you ran a barn or you came from a different state or a different, like things might not be the same way at the new place either. So get get local knowledge about the scenario. Yeah, something that I've learned even just doing this podcast is that people who are in the business and who do have knowledge to share are pretty willing to share it as long as you ask nicely. Um, and they have very good advice because most of them have been doing it and they've made mistakes and learned from them. So hear about their mistakes and what they learn from them and how they do things on a regular basis because most of the time they're pretty willing to share. I mean, what if, I mean, imagine you have a some type of small tractor that you you could multi-use. Maybe it's got a bucket load in the front. I don't know, whatever. You ask somebody and you're like, hey, I see that tractor that you have. Um, just don't assume that, hey, this is what I need when I open my barn. Just talk to them because they're going to tell you one of three things. They're going to say, yes, this is works perfect. There's nothing that it can't. There's nothing that I needed to do that I can't do. That perfect. Then I just got to get something similar to that. Or somebody says, you know what? I just didn't know what I needed to get. And I got this. And, you know, it, it, I, I got, I got, it's too much of it. I don't need all of the things that this tractor can do. That will probably be a lower frequency of response. But like I didn't need to buy this model. I could I could have bought a one model lower, for example. But I think that what you might find is like, hey, you know, we bought this because this is what was in the budget. But man, it still it can't do everything I needed to do. I wish I had gotten the one model higher. And you knowing that information is extremely important because they just told you a pain point, and it will be on you and your mistake if you decide to on purpose live that pain point yourself. They just told you, if I were to do it again, I wouldn't get this one. I'll get one model higher. Then you should be budgeting and finding the money for that model higher so you don't have the same pain point. And so that know-how, and I agree with you, people in the horse business are really um, knowledge sharing friendly. It's just, that's the, it's part of the, it's part of the, of the culture of being in the, in the horse world. Um, they will very gladly share that information with you. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today, but it's been great talking with you today. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, I appreciate the time and I hope your listeners um, just put a foot forward and get started with the budgeting. <laughs> yes, I agree. Thank you all for listening today. Please remember to like this podcast, subscribe, leave a review and recommend the Stable Management Podcast to a friend.